That's the part of it I don't really like. I want God to do something for me and I want Him to do it now. And so they cry and call on Him and say, Please, can't you see my real situation? God responds to your faith, not to your fears. He responds to your faith. You know what fear is? Fear is your faith in the ability of your enemy. When you have faith in the ability of the one who's destroying you, when you have faith in the power of sickness, that is fear. Because you trust the power of that sickness to destroy you. That means you have faith in the sickness. And therefore, you are afraid of it because you trust that it has the power to destroy you. So fear is faith in the negative supernatural force. Faith in God means that you trust His ability and you trust His word. Hallelujah. Oh, let me read this. So I, I, I said, the people who try to impress God by their works, they try to impress God by performing, you know, they try to perform to impress God. See, they live their life trying. Have you heard people say, when you ask them, are you born again? And they say, I'm walking on it. You see, they're walking on it. And the reason they're walking on it, they feel that they have not been good enough and that God may not accept them. They look at all the things that they have done wrong. And so they say, well, I don't think God will accept me. Um, I'm working on it. I've got a score to settle with God. When I'm through settling it, then I believe God will accept me. No. If you could do it on your own, Jesus would have never needed to die. And that is what Paul is saying here in the fourth verse of the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians. He says, Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Ye are falling from grace. See? He uses the law term here because in the, um, in the day in which Paul was living, they were striving to keep the law of Moses. Have you heard people say that they are trying to keep the Ten Commandments? They say, well, I may not be born again, I may not be as spiritual as you think I am, but, or the, as you think I should be, or as you think you are, but I, I know that in my life, I am trying to keep the Ten Commandments. You cannot keep the Ten Commandments. You know why? Because of the last one. Thou shalt not covet. Difficult to keep. Are you still there? You know why? Because God knew they would always say, when He says, Thou shalt not kill. They say, Well, I didn't kill anybody. But when it came to coveting, it had to do with the heart. You didn't do nothing with your hands, you did nothing with your eyes. A blind man can covet, mind you. <laughs> See? You just did it with your heart. And that's where the trouble is. Sin comes from the heart. That's where the problem is. So they say, well, I have kept the nine commandments, only the last one. And the Bible says, if you fail in one, you have failed in all ten. You are as disqualified as the one who never kept any of the ten at all. But what did Jesus do? He cancelled all the commandments and gave us a new one. Did you know he cancelled the commandments? Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. He cancelled them. He said, including the Ten Commandments. Oh yeah, he did. What about, are you saying now that uh, it's no longer wrong to steal? I didn't say that. I didn't say that. See what he did. He cancelled the commandments and gave us a new life. And with that life, he gave us a new commandment. And then that commandment, after we were born again and received that life, you know what he did? He didn't leave it as a commandment, he put it in our hearts. You know, he said to us, a new commandment give I unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you. That you also love one another. Then, the Bible tells us, 
You know, that was before we were born again. Because that was before Jesus died and was raised from the dead. But after we were born again, Paul told us in Romans, the fifth chapter, and the fifth verse, the latter part of the fifth verse, he said, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. See, we have the love of God in us. We are born that way. We are not trying to keep the, the, the law or commandment given to us by Jesus. We are not trying to keep it. We live it. We live that very life. Because the love of God is in us. We are born of God. Therefore, we are born of love. Can you say Amen. amen. Oh, but this is marvelous. Let me read again, verse 4. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are falling from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Did you notice that term? Righteousness by faith. We wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. What is the hope of righteousness by faith? The Bible says, he that hath this hope in him purified himself even as he is pure. The hope he's talking about is when Jesus comes out of heaven and we are taken out of this earth to meet him and we go with Jesus. That's the hope of the Christian. That's the hope of righteousness by faith. But the term I want you to observe there is when he calls it righteousness by faith. Which means there is another kind of righteousness. Hallelujah. You see... In the Old Testament, there was a righteousness that came by qualification from keeping the law. If you kept the law very, very well, you were a righteous man. If you did the things that you were supposed to do, you were a righteous man. But the Bible tells us that another righteousness was revealed from heaven. Hello? Can I show it to you? Romans 3rd chapter. Verse 21, he says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Another translation puts it this way. He says, But now a righteousness from God without the law is manifested or is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Hallelujah. Alright. So, he says, we wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. There is a righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith means that we walk by faith in the presence of God and according to the word of God. And therefore, we receive righteousness from God. Now, the righteousness from God is imparted to us when we are born again. It has become our life. It is the gift of God. This is righteousness. Hear me. Have you ever heard someone say, we are preaching the gospel? Have you ever heard it? Have you ever preached the gospel? Come on. Come on. Have you? Have you ever heard the gospel? Talk to me now. Have you ever preached the gospel? Let me tell you why it is called gospel. It, there's a difference when you say, we are preaching the message. Anybody, God only knows what the message is. Oh, we are preaching something, whatever that something is. We are preaching the kingdom of God, whatever it is. But when it comes to saying we are preaching the gospel, the term gospel means good news. What makes it good news? Hear me. When Jesus, oh boy, in Mark chapter 1, the Bible tells us that after John the Baptist was slain, Jesus came preaching the gospel. Alright? Jesus. And he said, repent and act on this glorious news. He called it a glorious news. He called it gospel, the good news. Remember that the people he was preaching to already knew about heaven. So, if he was there to tell them that one day they will go to heaven, that was not good news because they already knew it. There was nothing new. 
Hey, how would you like it if somebody came to your house knocking at your door? Guess what? Guess what? And you, you, you come out, you know, quickly, you open the door for him, and then he comes inside. He says, guess what? Hey, auntie has given birth. And you say, glory! Hey, that's wonderful! To who? They said, to John. And you know that John was born five years ago. You say, which John? Another one? He said, no, 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 the same one. He said, with John? He said, he's big like this now. What are you going to say to him? You would want to find out if he's gone nuts or something. <laughs> because that's not good news. It's not bad, but it's not good news. Because it's no news. So, but Jesus came preaching the good news. So the good news evidently was not a talk about heaven. No, no, no. It wasn't about heaven. Was he trying to tell them they're going to be uh, redeemed from the hands of the Romans? They knew that before. The prophets already told them that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Was he telling them that they're going to be blessed by God? If they kept the law very well. They already knew that. It was in the law. Blessed shall thou be in the field. Blessed shall thou be in the country. If you keep the law. They already knew that. So that's the good news. So definitely that was not the gospel. What is the gospel? What was the message that he brought to them? Why was it called good news? It was good news. Because it was a message about a free righteousness. It was a message telling the people that though you have been wicked, though you have been a sinner, though you have not lived right, God has announced that He declares you not guilty, discharged and acquitted, free to go home and then he declares you a righteous man. Now that's hard to believe. Religious folks cannot take that. So they say, kill him. Can you see it now? How can you say that this man who is a thief, he's a murderer, how can you say that God, just by him believing this message, suddenly becomes righteous. They can't believe that. It's too hard. So when Paul preached to the Gentiles, the Gentiles who were strange from God, alienated from the life of a new God, strange as to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. When Paul preached to them and said, Hear me, you Gentiles. Now you are justified by the blood of Jesus. The Jews went after Paul. And they said, kill him. They said, he's lying. The Gentiles are sinners. You know Gentiles? Gentiles are people who are not Jews, alright? Or other nations. And, and that word actually means heathen. So to tell the heathen that God is justifying them, declaring them righteous, was too good to be true. They wouldn't accept it. And you know, that's the way some people are today. When we preach the word to them. And say, God is not mad at you. They can't believe it. Because they did something wrong yesterday. And they did something wrong last week. And the other week. And the other month. And the other year. And all their life long. They've done so many wrong things. They can't believe it. And do you know that's the reason many people don't get healed. When they are sick. Because they think that God... He cannot heal them because they're too bad. And some think that God, He will not help them because they've done so many evil things in their lives. But this is the gospel. There is no gospel if we cannot make it plain. The gospel means that you are free. Even though you did wrong, somebody else paid for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, this is wonderful. Let me read something to you. Galatians chapter 2. 
You like this. Where's the time piece over here? Alright, good. Galatians chapter 2, now I'm reading from verse 20. Oh, hallelujah. I like this. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now that's the part I want to show you. It's the next verse I want to pick for you. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. You see that? If righteousness, if I can gain righteousness by my struggling, and by my keeping the law, and by my trying to perfect myself, then Christ is dead in vain. But Christ died for me so that I will not be condemned anymore. Every sin that I ever committed, every sin that I could ever commit, every sin that I would ever commit is all in Christ Jesus. He paid everything. Hallelujah. He paid everything. Everything. So I'm a free man? Yes, I am. Do you know something? When we preach like this, sometimes people tell us, they say, don't say that. Because when you say that, many people will go on living in sin. How could that be true? They were already living in sin without hearing this. You see, if you're already down, you are down. And there's no way to go but up. You can't go down more down, because you're already down. They used to say, he that is down needs fear no fall, because he's already down. There's only one way to go. Up. Hallelujah. And when you preach the gospel, there is a miracle power about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It causes you to love God. The Bible says we love Him because He first loved us. You see, love demands and creates response. Love causes you to love. When you know the love of God, you accept it and you respond in love. Otherwise, you didn't know it. Hallelujah. Oh, we'll come to that. This is marvelous. Paul said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the Lord, then Christ is dead in vain. He says, I refuse to frustrate the grace of God. What does that mean? I, I, I don't want the grace of God to fail in my life. Because God has extended His grace toward me. So I'm going to enjoy my life in the grace of God. Hallelujah. Give you an example. In the 14th chapter of the book of Acts, there's a man who was born important in his feet. Never walked from birth. He was in the city of Lystra. And when Paul was preaching, the man was on the ground. He couldn't walk. He was an adult. And... When Paul preached, the man listened. He heard the gospel. Then Paul said, in his message of the gospel, Paul said, Man, get up on your feet and walk. That was the grace of God extended. Because the man had been told, Jesus Christ suffered for your sickness. Which means your sickness has been paid for. Which means you are healed. As far as God is concerned, you should never be sick anymore. So now, if you believe that Jesus died for you, if you believe that He suffered the pains for you, if you believe that He paid all of that for you, then get up. Now, if the man had said, you know I can get up. I mean, I've been this way all my life long. The man would have frustrated the grace of God. When we preach the gospel, and people say, well, that was wonderful. I really wish it was so. (laughs) Anyway, thank God for some people who can try. Hmm. Some people, they are very very serious with God. I wish I could get serious. Anyway, then they go home. They have frustrated the grace of God. 
Paul said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Don't frustrate it. But that man didn't frustrate the, the grace of God. When Paul said, stand upon your feet, the Bible says the man leaped. He leaped and walked. He didn't wait. He said, that's for me. That's for me. Hallelujah. That's for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. Righteousness does not come by the law. Righteousness comes by faith. When you hear a message like this, you say, Father, I receive your righteousness. In the name of Jesus, I accept your righteousness. And do you know something? When you receive that righteousness by faith, it works in your life. It is a gift. You don't earn it. You don't achieve it. You don't buy it. You don't work for it. In Romans chapter 5, verse 17. I want you to see it for yourself. It says, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace. They which receive abundance of grace. Listen, Paul said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. That says, they which receive abundance of grace. They who receive it. It's one thing to give. It's another thing for the one who's been given to receive it. God has given His grace. He has poured out His grace upon us. They call it unmerited favor. Yeah, you didn't merit it. Yeah, but have you received it? Why don't you receive it? They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. Oh Lord, did I see that? Look at it now. He says the gift of righteousness. He didn't say they which are qualified in righteousness. He says they which receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. Righteousness is a gift. It comes from God. Free. You don't pay for it. You don't work for it. You just receive it. He says, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. So we receive the gift. He has given us a gift. It is called the gift of righteousness. In other words, he has given me, you know, righteousness is the nature of God. It is the nature and the life of God. That makes him right. That makes him do right. That gives us that life that knows no condemnation or inferiority. Hallelujah. It is the very essence of divinity. It is the life of Almighty God. It is a gift from God. It says, They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say, I do not frustrate the grace of God. I do not frustrate the grace of God. Oh no, don't frustrate it. Don't frustrate the grace of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Galatians chapter 5. I want to read verse 6. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision.